in a world, I think, where we as consumers, you know, are always looking for that extra reward or incentive or discount uh, when purchasing something. In this next session, we have a debate entitled Protection and Value Offered by Life Insurance Product Loyalty, Cross Product and Wellness Schemes. The debate will be conducted by Lafras Ekstian, Rian van Rienen, Natia Nicolay, Clyde Parsons, and Andy Warren, who form part of the LAC Conduct Market Subcommittee. After this debate on product loyalty schemes, you'll have the opportunity to vote for the winner. Please go to the polling feature within the presentation on the app, and please rate the debate according to the four criteria that we specify. Over to you, debaters. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining this debate. We are very excited to be talking about reward schemes today. And I must admit that my thinking has evolved a fair bit over the past few years. Initially, my thinking about rewards programs was very shallow and superficial. The only thing I cared about was, can I gym for free, or how can I pay as little as possible for the gym? Over time, though, I've learned that rewards programs are deeper, you must think about it a lot more, and I've reached a point in my life where my questions are more sophisticated. Um, specifically, the question I ask now is, how can I pay as little as possible for nappies? Because nappies are really expensive. <laughs> um, but before I bore you with nappies, my lack of gymming, and baby stories, let's move on to the real question for today, which is actually a really important one. Now, rewards programs have become part and parcel of the South African financial sector. Um, it's a typical example of our Rainbow Nation's innovation, which has also been exported across the globe. Now, with any new invention or new product comes some element of risk. And I think the previous talk lined us up perfectly for this discussion today. Because when something new like epigenetic, epigenetic testing or a product variation or an invention or a technology comes along, um, it's very difficult at the outset to predict all the implications because there are first order effects which we are fairly good at recognizing, there are second order effects which are difficult to actually predict, and then there's the way in which the environment and the users behave as a response to this new invention, um, which is very difficult to actually predict. Um, and that's why it's useful to pause at some point after something new has been launched, take a step back and understand the implications. Um, and it's important to do this rather sooner than later um, because if there are lurking issues, lurking challenges, they will eventually come to the surface. Um, but if we become aware of them sooner, it allows us more time to react and potentially influence the outcome. And that is why LAX Market Conduct Subcommittee has brought this debate to the convention to discuss the interaction of reward schemes with peer risk life insurance products. So, the motion being debated today is on the screen, and we are going to discuss reward schemes provide more value to policyholders than to shareholders. One team of debaters will argue for this motion, and the other team will argue against this motion. There's also a bit in brackets on the screen, which provides very important context. It says that reward schemes are not subject to the same governance requirements as life insurance premiums of, or life insurance products. Um, and that is important context because, for example, um, life insurance products are heavily regulated. An example is that any changes to existing premiums, any premium increases, are governed by the details of Rule 15 of the Policy of Protection Rules, um, which does not apply to rewards programs. And it could be asked, does this in give insurers more freedom than what they would otherwise have if there is a rewards program at play? <coughs> then, a few points I'd like to highlight before we start the debate. Is firstly, our debate today is limited to the interaction between rewards programs and pure risk life insurance products. So we're not looking at investment products or insurance products which have an investment and a risk component so that we can narrowly define the debate and have a good focused discussion. The debate is also at an industry level, so we're not looking at delving into the specific nuances and features of different product providers. Now the debate is a nice format because it allows us to put two polarized views on the table. Polarized views 
often are controversial. Um, and that is part of the benefit, is that we can talk about potentially controversial topics and discuss them openly. With that said, um, please, when the debaters present their views, um, don't see those as personal views, nor employer views, but rather as someone taking part in a debate and have been assigned a certain role to debate that side of the argument. It's very similar to debates in school, where a topic is said and people go for and against. Um, and then lastly, even though we are talking about reward schemes today, I think it's important to consider this discussion in a broader market conduct sense. Um, because today we'll see some experienced actuaries untangle the ambiguity that we often see when we discuss market conduct issues. And this is the type of ambiguity that we run into in the workplace. And what we'll see today is a way to unpack and untangle that complexity so that we can help make good decisions in our work environments. So, who is going to do the debating today? We have a team of wise and discerning debaters. But they are also fairly competitive, I must say, I've learned over the past few weeks. Um, in the red corner, arguing in favor of the motion. In other words, arguing that more value is provided to policyholders than shareholders. We have Rian van Rienen and Nathan Nicolay. Rian is the CEO of Discovery Life and has been part of Discovery Life since its inception in the year 2000. He has a particular passion for incentive programs in the life insurance space aimed at making people healthier. Nathan Nicolet is his partner today and is the head of product loyalty and rewards at Sunlum Fintech. She has 30 years of experience in financial services with the last 10 in product development and the application of behavioral science. In the blue corner, arguing against the motion. In other words, arguing that reward schemes coupled with life insurance provide more value to shareholders and policyholders, we have Andrew Warren and Clyde Parsons. Andrew is head of Deloitte's financial services advisory team, he is the firm's insurance sector leader, and has diverse experience including distribution, product dev, and reporting. Clyde is Brightrock's chief innovation officer, and as one of their founders, he is core to the development of their unique needs-matched life insurance offering. Thank you to each of you for volunteering and all the preparation that has gone into it. Now before the fun starts, let's quickly discuss the structure for today. It's a typical debating structure. We'll have opening comments, which consist of four slots of five minutes each, which would go for the motion, against the motion, and then for and against. We have ample time for questions. We have ample time for questions. And I think I just want to reiterate here, yeah? I mentioned this is a safe space. Um, so please do ask the uncomfortable, the awkward, or the controversial questions. I won't be answering them in any case. That's up to the debaters. <laughs> So, after that we'll have closing arguments and then we give the power to the people. You will, at the end of this, cast your vote in a live poll to see which of these two teams has the quickest thinking, fastest talking actuaries on the day. So without further delay, let's start. Debating teams, um, please just a reminder, you have five minutes for this bit. Um, I'll give you a heads up when there's 30 seconds left. Rian, if you can please kick us off for the motion. Thanks, Lefras. I think as your opening comments as well as the previous session has shown, it's quite an important topic ranging from vit understanding vitality age to the, the power of getting discount on nappies. So, so hopefully we can, can uh, share a few views there. So I've got the pleasure of opening this debate today, um, and for the purpose of the debate, I've got five key points that I'd like to share with you to really demonstrate uh, why uh, reward programs and incentive programs provide significant values to policyholders. So the first point, incentive programs promote positive behavior change that unlocks value that didn't exist before. And I think importantly to emphasize that point, we need to distinguish between simple loyalty schemes as well as, uh, versus incentive programs that aim to promote positive behavior change that promotes uh, financial as well as physical behavior change unlocking real, uh, real value. So 
a correctly structured incentive scheme can align the incentives of policyholders and shareholders to create a win-win scenario, and those incentives need to lead to pure behavior change that generates value that didn't exist before, and that can provide immense benefits and rewards to policyholders. Behavior change that will increase financial security and physical wellness is really holds immeasurable value for policyholders. So, moving on to just thinking how incentive scheme can promote uh, choice as well as competition but to the benefit of policyholders, reward and incentive schemes are voluntary and thereby provides choice to policyholders, both at the outset as well as throughout the term of a policy. It's thus important that in, uh, a reward scheme needs to be structured to ensure sustainability, to generate real value that didn't exist before, and that then can be channeled to rewards and additional benefits to policyholders. Incentive schemes have been known to create enhanced benefits through additional competition, and that's great for customers and great for policyholders. And then I think importantly, and touching on one of the opening comments that Lafras made, uh, the structures and the rules of a program needs to be clearly laid out at inception to ensure the fair treatment of policyholders. The policyholder protection rules, or PPRs, actually do specifically uh, define loyalty benefits and related services and incorporate those into the framework, ensuring that these benefits provided within a policy are governed within a TCA framework, providing extra protection and extra benefits to policyholders. Then thirdly, and the most important point in my view, is that incentive schemes that promote genuine behavior change is good for policyholders and for society. It generates financial well-being um, and value that didn't exist before and can be very powerful um, to lessen the burden of disease in society. So if we consider some of the data from the World Health Organization uh, from a report published last year in 2022, according to the WHO, 71% of all deaths worldwide in 2019, so that's pre the pandemic, was as a result of chronic disease. And importantly, they reckon that a third of these are considered as premature deaths or preventable deaths. So the prevalence of lifestyle-related chronic diseases increased dramatically over recent decades, linked directly to rising obesity, bad nutrition, and sedentary behavior. The WHO project further that the population older than 60 years of age will double from about 12% currently to 22% by 2050. This emphasized the role that we as the actuarial profession have to play in reducing the burden of chronic disease on society and especially at older ages. In addition to modeling risk, we've got an obligation to promote genuine improvement in risk and reducing risk. Incentive programs, provide a very powerful mechanism and importantly provide the funding to improve health and also that policyholders can gain financially. Then fourthly, incentive programs provides additional data and insights into policy preferences, thereby personalizing benefits and pathways to both better financial outcomes um, as well as wealth, wellness outcomes for policyholders. And then lastly, my fifth point, really is how do we know that incentive programs work? How do we know that they are effective? And I would argue that the ultimate proof of whether incentive programs are effective and provide great value to customers and policyholders is to consider what policyholders tell us. What, is, what does it do to persistency uh, for policyholders engaging in incentive programs? I think it's common cause that policyholders who engage in incentive programs um, and reap the financial rewards um, have significantly better persistency than comparable policyholders. So to conclude, incentive programs greatly benefits policyholders by uh, promoting positive behavior that unlocks value, um, providing choice and promoting competition, providing value to society and policyholders by reducing the burden of disease, providing personalized benefits, and the proof is in the superior persistencies of, persistency of policyholders that do engage. So with that, I'm going to and you over to the next, uh, next debater. Thank you. So, so thanks, Rhiannon, and, and thanks for that, uh, opening the debate. Um, so 
I think it's important to note that, that what we are arguing is not that there is no value in reward schemes. And I think Rian's done a great job at giving you all the value statements. And so for those who engage with reward schemes, there is, there's financial benefit and there are benefits around change behavior. But what we are arguing is that when reward schemes are tied and can uh, tie to, to insurance contracts and can materially affect the contractual terms of those contracts, but those schemes are not under the same governance structure as those contracts, the shareholders stand to benefit, benefit disproportionately more from the aggregate share, uh, policyholder pool. So schemes like this that are, that are, that are described in that way provide uh, outside of premium review release mechanism that transfers risk back to the policyholder um, in the context of, of those schemes. And, and it's important to look at it when we look at the, the underlying principles of, of risk insurance. And, and so two key aspects come to, to mind in terms of this regard. The first is around underwriting, and the second is that the contracting of a determined premium for a fixed set of benefits. So these, and these happen under the overall um, pooling of risk, so that the fortunate few, sorry, so the, 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 the fortunate many pay for the unfortunate few in terms of insurance principles. And under this lens, when we look at insurance contracts that way, the long-term insurer is entering into a contract that transfers an uncertain, unknown, unaffordable future for a predictable, known, and affordable premium. And the upfront, upfront underwriting process just assesses the risk to ascribe that predictable future premium based on the benefits that are to be covered. And yes, we know that not these premiums and the new generation products are not fully guaranteed. And there are options for insurers to renew these premiums in, the, in line with the, the way the products are structured. But, this, but with this, there it places a, an obligation to put the policyholder interests um, uh, first against a potential unilateral change to contract terms. And as Lefras pointed out, premium reviews like this are implemented under regulatory requirements of the policyholder protection rules and guided by actual judgment informed by actual practice note 114. So, so some reward schemes do offer the discounts on long-term insurance contracts, both on base behavioral and product cross-holdings. And eligibility requirements that describe this are adjusted on a periodic basis to achieve the objectives of the reward scheme and that of the sponsoring company. These are not the features of all reward schemes, and it's those reward schemes that we're contemplating in terms of this debate. And so when reward schemes like that have a non-fixed rule set, then it can affect the participation level in the scheme that then ultimately affects discounts or potential surcharges on premiums of the underlying insurance contract. This creates that risk transfer process that was not defined or expected or appreciated by the policyholder at inception of the dual contract, given the explicit contractual natures and the existing review protections. And this undermines that fundamental principle of insurance. This trade of uncertainty of outcome for certain costs has been nullified to some extent. But as they say in the adverts, there's a bit more to this. And so yes, the policyholders can benefit from the lower premiums, particularly under the behavioral schemes. But they can also suffer a double, a double whammy from the change to their health status in the context of these schemes. Outside their own control, they may lose some element of their ability to stay healthy, purely by accident or some other mechanism. The triggers in the data gathering is done with the ability for the policyholder to stay healthy. And at the point that they start losing that health status, they can, their premiums can increase by as much as 30%. And they may lapse because of their unaffordability. And then they lose the ability to maintain their historic underwriting status, which they entered into the system with. And so that implicit long-term guarantee of initial underwriting is lost because of a change to a premium that changes their affordability. And it's at that time, potentially, that they need the cover most. So we have to ask ourselves the question when we're looking at what the fundamental need being met by the policy is, are we doing something that actually inhibits a, a person's ability to have cover when they need it most? So I do believe in the, in the value of reward schemes. They do bring tangibility to an otherwise intangible product. But I also need to believe that we need to acknowledge that in their current form, and if left unchecked, these tilt the balance of power 
from the policyholder to the shareholder outside the requirements that are set in terms of the underlying contracts. So is it not time to look at the benefit design and participation rules of the reward schemes or contemplate the design and benefit structure of the policies to make sure that they're aligned or, and, and so to meet the dynamic needs of the reward schemes. We'll leave it to you to decide at the end of this debate. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew and Athia. Thank you. Andrew, um, I would like to um, comment on your points, but I will leave it for a bit later. I'd like to make a few points of my own. Um, the first um, comment I just have for Andrew, though, is that this debate is not about um, the inability to design a decent incentive program linked to decent financial security. So that is a failure of the designers. Um, what we're talking about today, however, is the benefit and the benefit that many South Africans enjoy to actually belong to a loyalty and rewards program. We know that 73% of South Africans belong to loyalty and rewards programs and we know 23% of those South Africans say that um, belonging to the program actually sway their decision um, when it comes to what they buy and where they put their money. We know that loyalty and rewards programs are there to assist the policyholder in the long road to, um, over their lifetime to gain financial confidence and to gain um, financial wealth and to remain and retain their health and well-being. Um, firstly, I want to make a point about um, fintech and gamification. That is something that's a bit of a bass word currently. And we know in South Africa, like Jeremy has pointed out this morning, um, we are inundated with things like flooding. Um, I had a river running through my house in Camps Bay a while ago because of the flooding in the Western Cape. Um, we are inundated by riots. We are inundated by um, potholes and dangers on the road. And these risks um, struck South Africans, not the ones necessarily who are risk averse like we are, but the ones who are trying to face every day in a, in a courageous way. And those South Africans can permanently lose their ability to get up and to face society again after a disaster has struck them. And so with the incentive schemes, we remind South Africans what the importance is of insurance to retain their premium, um, to, to retain their policy, which is a bit of a grudge purchase as well. Then um, just another point I would like to make in terms of um, long-term versus short-term rewards. So if you have a well-structured incentive program where the cost of the rewards are well-managed and where you don't reach your breakage point easily and the benefits of this program is given back to the policyholder, you will see that the short-term rewards play into the psychological argument of hyperbolic discounting which says that smaller short-term rewards are more important for people than large long-term gains um, or payouts from policies at retirement or at an older age. So we need to support South Africans to stay the course and incentive programs do exactly that. They offer smaller short-term rewards that are seen as very important to customers and they help them on their road towards a long-term sustainable future. Another point in favor of the fact that policyholders might actually gain far more from incentive programs than shareholders is that data and contactability reminds customers to continuously update their contact details, update the beneficiary contact details, making sure that all the savings and the liabilities that we are the custodians of end up in the pocket of the beneficiaries, not in unclaimed benefit funds. And we make sure that customers are actually benefiting from business intelligence. Um, a final point, um, just before I will address some of Andrew's um, 
uh, rebuttals here is that um, in terms of value creation, we know that um, you know, staying healthy, uh, eating healthily, exercising, all the things that we need to do to lead a long and healthy life might be easy for those of us who are competitive by nature and um, those of us who have young children who are competitive by nature and uh, visit the gyms regularly. But we do also know that it's not always easy for the majority of South Africans. And so in creating extra value through assisting customers through their lifelong journey, we know that um, we create extra value in society that both the shareholder and the policyholder can enjoy. Um, so just to, to continue um, around the legislative aspects that um, Andrew has mentioned, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish then on that point. Um, <laughs> policyholder protection rules do protect the policyholder and to make sure that um, contractual changes um, are being taken into account when incentive programs are designed. Um, so it, it should be um, addressed in terms and conditions. The cost um, and the regularity of the changes should be disclosed to policyholders. In fact, the PPRs ask us to do that, especially when um, the value of the loyalty programs are more than 10% of the, of the premiums. So I'll leave it to um, Lafras to continue. Thanks, Nathia. As an industry, we've developed a code of standards and a robust set of protections to protect our policyholders, particularly when it comes to premiums. And Andrew took us through a couple of those, premium guarantees and premium review standards. Today's presentation distills down to one core concept. Do reward schemes that, opposite, that operate outside of those protections undermine the value that they give policyholders. We concede and we accept that they add value, that they can create benefit, but where their rules and their regulations are not aligned with those of the contract, do they compromise the policyholder? And that's what you'll be asked to consider today. In December, I made a New Year's resolution that this year I'd run my first half trail marathon. It's October and it's not looking good. <laughs> that wasn't the obligatory joke to get the story going, it's a real story. Much like LaFrasse's gym, I'm not really on track. And I use this example to illustrate a famous behavioral economic. We are all overly optimistic and because of that we make suboptimal decisions and we have incorrect expectations about our future selves. And we all do that. Why that's relevant to today's discussion is those expectations and, and those unfair, optimal, um, optimistic expectations are not necessarily aligned with reality as it pans out. That's exacerbated by an asymmetry of information that exists between the policyholder and the shareholder. There's a power imbalance. Those two combine to mean, the, the combination of those two means that the insurer can effectively leverage that imbalance of information and that economic, that behavioral economic. So the argument to Rian's point, number two on choice and voluntary participation isn't really valid. An insurer has got an army of professionals like yourself. They've got all the statistical data. They know that on average, we won't all be the person on the poster. They can leverage that asymmetry. If they enter into a contract, they do so on commercials and they know it will work out. But unfortunately, as humans, we make irrational decisions. And so the choice argument and the voluntary argument doesn't hold water if you think about the asymmetry of information and the fact that we are eternally optimistic. That's one of Rion's points. I want to go through the rest very quickly while I've got a gap. The second third point were the disease burden and the behavioral impact. Andrew conceded that. We absolutely agree that reward schemes add value. They they change behaviors, they improve outcomes, and we accept that. But today's question is, do they all add more value to the policyholder or to the shareholder, particularly when they operate outside of the protections of the premium? If the insurance scheme has got a pricing valve, 
to continuously review those premiums. They have the ability to continuously re-rate the client. Where that rate is, is academic, because the insurer is charging the correct rate, and they are therefore protected. But the fact that they can unilaterally alter that contract should be of alarm to all of us. Any contract that can be unilaterally changed by the other counterparty is going to be bad for you. So entering into a contract where the other party can unilaterally change the rules of the game is never going to ensure that you have more value or more protection than the counterparty. On the point of financial well-being or personalized benefits, I argue the same point. If the insurer is paying a price for something, they're doing so on commercial terms. It's a transaction and they're getting more value from that transaction than they're willing to pay for it. So any financial value is exceeded by the value that the insurer gets from it. And that proves today's point of where does the balance of value sit between insurer and policyholder. <clears throat> Andrew took us through how rewards and loyalty schemes that are not subject to the existing governance co controls and protections effectively undermine the principle of insurance and the transferring of risk. But I'll go one step further and say the biggest concern for me is that they undermine the value of a contract because they allow unilateral changes to that contract by the insurer, which can detrimentally affect the policyholder at the end of the day. We are not, by any stretch of the imagination, arguing that reward schemes should be outlawed. We accept that they add massive value. We accept that they add massive change. We accept that there is a massive disease burden. Albeit in South Africa, we have a bigger accidental component. Any way to get that disease burden down is going to be a positive. What we are, however, advocating is that we consider the impact of those reward schemes and loyalties and how they relate to existing protections and governance, particularly when it comes to premiums. If we can acknowledge that as long as they are disconnected, there is a risk to the client and they negate and undermine the value that those protections exist on the premiums, that's a start. As a team, we think we've got the first steps in a market conduct framework that could solve those problems without losing all the massive benefits that reward schemes bring. And we'll bring that to you in our solutions section. But what I'd ask you to consider is open your minds to acknowledging as a profession that when they are misaligned to the contractual governance and contractual guarantees, we have a problem and we undermine all the work that we've done already. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde, um, and everybody else for the very interesting debate. Um, we can now move over to questions. So, as I mentioned, um, please, any questions, as uncomfortable as you can make them, please. Otherwise, I think we'll go straight to the app. Um, Doug on the app says, is there ev any evidence that the improving persistency is due to the program, or is it because more loyal customers are the ones that join these programs? Um, Rian, Nathia. Hello. Is it on? Um, there is definitely evidence. Um, at uh, my company, we have um, done extensive statistical um, analysis and built some models to see um, when you exclude certain factors, whether um, the actual incentives and the customers that are being engaged through these incentives have better persistency than those are unengaged. And we've allowed for all the other factors that might impact on higher persistency. Um, and we even went as far as applying a bit of machine learning, throwing data robot at it, see uh, if the FinTech um, guys um, or robots um, also come to the same conclusion. And we have proven that um, there's definitely causality. We know there's correlation, but there is causality. So the chicken and egg argument doesn't, um, doesn't hold for us. We do know that incentives drive persistency. Thank you, Nathia. Um, Andrew, Clyde, any comments on that one? Yeah. Um, 
Hello. <laughs> um, yes, sorry. The, the, so my question is, is a bit more out of the perspective of the value to policyholder versus shareholder um, that's, that's been in the motion. So um, I've looked at some um, quote comparisons between some of the companies that's very focused on reward programs like uh, Discovery, FMB, and so on. So what I found is that the starting premium is quite high um, compared to more traditional life insurers. Um, so when you then take the discount into account, then it becomes much more competitive. Um, so the question is, with the rewards programs, firstly, you sort of already over, not overpriced, but um, ask a higher premium to the higher risk policyholders. And secondly, um, due to these incentives, then obviously these policyholders, they pay their premiums for longer. So um, aren't you then creating more value to the shareholders rather than the policyholders. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think it's important to have a like-for-like -like comparison, um, and that's, that's typically um, the first port of call that one needs to look at to, to have those like-for-like -like comparisons. So once you strip out like-for-like, -like, um, I mean, what we found is the industry is very, is very competitive. Is really, I mean, the competitiveness factors um, in a very uh, well uh, represented industry will we'll sort that out. So I think then, then the point becomes, so you do, you do have a benefit of uh, discounts for, for certain, uh, on certain conditions um, where, uh, where rewards programs and incentive programs are involved. And that's to the benefit of the, of the policyholder and the customer. Discounts tend to be a good thing. So that's, uh, that's, that's certainly transfer value from the shareholder to the policy, not, not vice versa. And I think then also on the point linked to, to that question, so what happens if that policyholder should suffer a, a life-changing event, a really detrimental event? And I think some of, the, some of my um, colleagues on the left has, has uh, spoken about that. Your best designed wellness program should kick in and provide shareholder value, or policyholder value exactly there. It should manage the condition. It should enable the policyholder through the worst of times to enable them to uh, manage that condition and have a better outcome. And I can't think of any better uh, policy benefit, policyholder benefit than managing that condition through, an exp uh, through a terrible time. It also typically your best designed um, policies and, and uh, programs will lock in your underwriting status at that, at that point in time, providing further protection uh, to the policyholder. So, no, I think the short answer is on a like for like comparison. Discounts will transfer value from shareholders to policyholders at the benefit of a policyholder. Cool. Thank you, Rian. I'm glad. And maybe if you can comment on the competitiveness yeah. as well. I think sure, maybe, maybe just to elaborate uh, on, on Rian's point. Um, I, think, I think also at an industry and, and conceptual level, it's worth considering reward pro, uh, programs uh, from a more agnostic perspective. So the example that you've given is one model of, or mechanism of passing the value back to the client. But it relies on an upfront discount, which one could argue attracts more clients to that insurer, which is good for the insurer. And then secondly, it relies on a future premium, which then becomes uncertain and contingent on certain behavior. Now, the insurer has to recover that upfront discount. And as people lapse and as persistency works out, at however it, it works, if there's any lapses, they have to recover the upfront discount of the people who lapsed from those who remain. And so there's a, there's a degree of variability in that future premium. And that's what we would argue is, is what worries us. But that doesn't take away from the value of rewards programs. We see massive value in rewards programs. What we're more advocating is the model in which that value is passed to the client. And so I wouldn't use one isolated example of discounted upfront premiums with variable uncertain uh, future escalations as a proxy for that value. And when we close, we'll introduce one or two examples of market conduct principles that can be used to ensure that the client is still protected in that scenario, but that the model and mechanism to pass the value uh, ensures that the client gets the, the absolute value. And we see those massive, massive second order impacts from reward schemes without compromising the certainty and the fundamental principle of insurance of that transfer of risk. Cool. Thank you, Clyde. Thank you so much. Another question online from Carsten that says, to the against team, 
You say that loyalty programs are misaligned to policy contracts. Can you explain this or provide some examples? So, so in, the, in the context of what we're describing, it's the schemes where uh, the benefit structure is linked to a layer in scheme. So the, 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 the reward schemes have level one, two, three, and four in them, and depending on what level you're in, the discount or the premium adjustment is linked to that level. Now, if we take an example of a purist product where you've got a 10-year guarantee term, you sign up for that 10-year guarantee term, your policy's got that guarantee, um, the mechanisms, mechanisms that are in place when we get to that 10-year point, and that's been the debate of the, of the Market Conduct Committee for a long time, is how do you make sure that the, um, the, the repricing of a product at that point doesn't recoup prior losses um, as one of, the, one of the fundamental tenets of, of, of how we look at it. And those have been interesting debates to be had and, and executed on. But between the first year and the 10th year, the scheme rules themselves are adjusted in terms of how you are able to participate and what level in the scheme you're in, whether you move from level three to level two or level, level um, three to level four based on next year's criteria that were not defined at the point of time of the sale. So the, the idea of a, of a long-term contract that has a defined premium for at least 10 years with now this variability overlay that is independent of that process is what we are arguing is part of the challenge that we've got in, in the scheme and, and, and long-term insurance design process. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Nathia? Um, I just want to make a comment about um, the, the linking of the premiums to um, contracts and that there are different ways to link extra value uh, to contracts. So you can obviously provide a discount on a premium or you can provide an increase in, in the payment um, or the sum assured or a cashback bonus. Um, so um, in, in doing product designs and in taking into account the policyholder needs and also the sophistication of your policyholder base. Are you designing for only diamond status clients or are you designing um, for more entry-level market clients, people who are less aspirational? So you need to understand your market segment. And when you do the design, um, the needs of the market segment can then manifest in different ways. Through a cashback, um, that, that will stay fairly constant. You can do those illustrations um, on a continuous basis. Um, you can have the same discussion and re-emphasize the, the benefit of staying on course um, and, and uh, working through your tiers if you want to. You can also, in your design, decide how often you want to change the rules of the incentive program. So I think design plays a huge uh, um, part in making sure that there's a balance between the share of policyholders and shareholders, and policyholders in the South African context do benefit um, more often when it comes to good product design. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, there's a question from the floor. Hi, uh, Giles War. Um, so I feel like we're not really getting to, to, to this question because the, the, the question is, does it provide more value to the policyholders than to the shareholders? Okay, so, so um, a, a lot of the discussion is, is around the pooling principle. So, so uh, the um, uh, underwriting uh, puts policyholders in different pools, um, gives them a, a premium that, that they have to pay because of the pool they're in. Um, the, the problem with reward schemes is if they move people from one pool to another pool. Okay, maybe not in the life insurance sort of sector, but outside the life insurance uh, sort of, um, contract, but, but it, it blows back to the life insurance premium. Is, is that giving, I mean, you could say that that is giving po uh, value to the healthy policyholders, uh, the ones who um, continue in good health, um, but, did, but, but um, um, giving a, a disbenefit to the people who uh, fall into bad health. So that, that is between different groups of policyholders. But the question is about shareholders. Are, are shareholders getting more money 
um, because uh, of the reward schemes? I don't know, because, because uh, we don't have the information. I hear that the, the original principles of vitality were to be break-even for the scheme itself, but there may have been um, uh, benefits to, um, uh, to the company that, that we don't know about. Has anybody got any evidence for this? So, so I'll, I'll take the, the more philosophical rather than the evidential point, and, and I'll look at it in the context of um, risk transfer and risk certainty equals value. So, so if we look at that argument and we work out where risk resides, and so certainty um, is more valuable than uncertainty. And if we look at through the first 10-year period, we have, we have outside of a, a reward-backed life insurance contract given a certain amount of certainty which is of value to policyholders in the aggregate. So, so yes, transferring and working on which policyholder subgroup got more value or less value is quite a difficult one because we are doing continuous underwriting through this process. But in terms of the reason why we need to be considering this in the context of how you consider your pricing, your, your repricing point at the 10-year point, where there has been a, a scheme in play that has defined the ultimate premium received, is there was, under a non-tied arrangement, certainty for the policy to the 10-year point, under the, non, under the tied arrangement, and less certainty. And so the value equation we're looking, without doing the quantitative measures, is, is that's the underlying tenant of our argument around where a lot of the value exchange has happened in this space. Uh, yeah. Maybe if I can uh, also comment on that question. I think you've, you've mentioned the transfer of risk between different policyholders and different pools, and we've also spoken about uh, discounts and discounts being recouped and and so on uh, in some of the counter arguments. I think that misses a fundamental point in terms of, uh, and I've tried to address that in, uh, in one of my opening statements and maybe I can reiterate that, that we, we have to um, consider the differences between a peer reward program that charges a fee and can only generate value from that fee versus an incentive program that sets out to create value that didn't exist before. So if, if you can get policyholders to engage, to live healthy, to actually lower their risk. So the risk is different to what it would have been without that reward and incentive program. Then you generate real value. You're not just transferring the risk from one area to another. And that real value that didn't exist before by reducing risk and reducing the burden of disease, you can then use to provide benefits and you, because you have funding available that never existed before, and that provides tremendous value to the policyholder financially, in addition to the value that the policyholder get from living a better life and a healthier life. Okay, there were some more questions from the floor. Uh, over that side. Oh, we already have a mic. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Msiwa, question for Clyde. So earlier on, you, you referred to the benefits that um, insurers can obtain by, by f continuously having up-to-date data uh, when uh, clients update their information on a regular basis because there's a benefit to them. So, so my question is, aren't you indirectly conceding to the other side that there's more value to the shareholder because as an insurer, you will have the obligation to either verify the beneficiary at a claim stage, but you were now able to keep an up-to-date data as a result of the, of the rewards program, which now, for, let's say for example, protects your reputation because you are able to fulfill your obligation on time, and therefore your future sales is not affected, you are still able to sell more, and then indirectly, you have created a sustained value for the shareholder. So I just want to make sure that I understand so that when I make my voting, I don't give you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, the, the really uh, cleverly designed loyalty programs will definitely do that calculation to see how much money you will save at claim stage if you have up-to-date contact details and, you know, um, what is the, the cost-benefit between, um, you know, uh, outbound contact detail updates versus inbound contact detail updates on the app, etc. Um, but 
And the trick is to obviously give some of that extra value that's now being generated back to the policyholders through vouchers and incentives to say thank you, you get more tier points, you can translate this into some real value for yourself, um, or you know, thank you for doing this, you retain your tier status. So um, the, the customers out there, as I said, 73% of them are on rewards programs. They've got 9.2 programs in their wallet on average. So the South Africans are very shrewd and they know how to play the, the rewards programs and they expect something back in return, not only an easier claims process at claim stage. So yes, there is shareholder value, obviously, but um, the shrewd uh, policyholders can definitely get a lot of nice value for themselves um, until that big claim comes. Uh, Clyde, and then maybe after that we can take one more question. Uh, there's one just more question over there. So, sorry. sorry, Clyde just wants to oh, respond. Thanks, Clyde. Clyde. Just uh, maybe one consideration to the data for me. Um, the ability to keep your records up to date is not the biggest consideration in my mind, and I think you, you may be missing a, a, a key point there. Going forward, this industry and this profession is going to be fundamentally driven by data. We're all going to be uh, well, we all have to be very aware of the power that data has and the value that it brings any organization. As individuals, we're going to have to be acutely aware of the value that the data we have and how easily we give that up. So I think one point to add, if we're talking about the balance of, of, of value, think about the amount of value that comes from all the aggregated data on all the metrics from all your clients and seeing and having line of sight of that data. And that's what the company is paying for. If they're willing to pay for that in a transactional, uh, in a, in a tr transactional payment, they are getting more value from the transaction than what they're willing to pay for. So those financial incentives that come to the client, is, part of it is for selling your data, but that data is massively, massively valuable to, to any insurer or to any company in today's day and age. And I think that's worth keeping in mind if you think about that balance. Thanks, Clyde. Um, we can maybe do one more question before closing arguments. Hi. Uh, yes, Nathan Brits. Um, so significant benefits can be given back to the policyholders. That's the uh, intention of the company. But what protects the policyholders if that's not exactly the intention? So is when it's quite complicated products or non-transparent, uh, what pr protects them from changes to the benefit structure, which can significantly uh, decrease the value over time. And maybe just to just to add to that question, I think um, some of those changes could originate from elsewhere in the business, not from the life insurance product. And a person having only a life product might then be, well, I guess, advantaged or disadvantaged by um, experiences elsewhere in the business. So I'll um, I'll give a go at that one. I think there, there are a number of factors that protect. Um, policyholders. So I think first and foremost you've got commercial factors. I mean if you do something to to hurt the benefits of a policyholder, that wouldn't be good for your business in the long term. I mean policyholders have got a, a one-way selection option against uh, against the insurance company. They can lapse at any time and move their business move their business elsewhere at, at certainly at a pooled at a pooled level. Um, so that that's one factor. And then I think inherent in your actual design, I mean in the a long-term policy contract, there are terms and conditions of exactly how that policy would operate under various conditions. And well, you, you'll typically find that your, your policies um, give protection against certain events. So I've given the example before that after a life-changing event in certain conditions, um, certain benefits are locked in for really the lifetime of the rest of the rest of that contract. That's one example of how it could work. And the sustainability of the actual um, incentive and reward scheme is another critical factor. You need to think of a long-term sustainability. And that would offer further protection to policyholders to make sure that, that a company won't do anything to the detriment of the appeal and the survival of that long-term scheme. So I think there's explicit contractual terms providing protection to policyholders, there are commercial factors, and then lastly to reiterate, I think we've made the, made the point before and, and Nafi has also mentioned that, uh, that there's an explicit definition of loyalty benefits as well as um, other services in the actual PPRs that govern TCF outcomes. 
and that's explicitly addressed in, in, uh, in some of the regulations. So, 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 so one thing I want to pick up, which links to my second point around this, and that is the notion that in a customer's mind there's an implicit guarantee of perpetual underwriting class based on their original underwriting criteria. And I think we need to be careful about considering lapse as a mechanism that suggests the policyholder has an open option against an insurer. It is very difficult at a particular point for an unhealthy policyholder to choose to leave a policy that they got when they were healthy and then try and re-enter the insurance market. They are going to be carrying that extra health burden with them. So the risk that, that I, you know, we highlight in terms of these kind of structures is we need to be careful then about a ancillary scheme that can reduce benefits later on off the back of the fact that I under, underwrote someone at, at inception and my conceptual protection mechanism is, oh, it's okay, if, if I'm treating them badly, they will lapse and they are neutral. I don't think a lapsed policyholder who has a worse health condition than they had when they entered the insurance market is a protection mechanism. Uh, we do need to think about that from the perspective of how it emerges from a consumer perspective when we're considering the, let's call it open market nature of risk products in our markets. Cool. Thanks, Andrew and Rian. Um, okay, and then that brings us to the end of the questions. Um, time to wrap up the arguments with closing comments. Um, Andrew Clyde, you're up first. We've openly recognized the value that rewards and loyalty schemes can bring to the policyholder. We take the point on behavioral change. We absolutely concede the point of a reduced disease burden, and I love the point about the value of hyperbolic discounting. We take those points. Yes, there are massive benefits to be gained. However, what we cannot accept is that where those schemes operate outside of the same governance principles inherent in the contract, they add more value to the policyholder than the shareholder. And I'll avert your attention to the slide on, uh, on the board at the moment. For me, if I was to underwrite, underline a component of that, of that slide, I would, underwrite, I would underline the component that says not being subject to the same governance requirements. And that's what this debate is distilled down to. We've shown, to the last question of the gentleman in blue, We've shown that if left unchecked, there are potentially four serious harms that rewards and loyalty schemes that affect contractual terms can be detrimental to the policyholder. Namely, they undermine the, fun the fundamental principle of insurance relating to the transfer of risk and the confidence that I have about a predictable, affordable, consistent premium. Secondly, they expose the policyholder to unilateral contractual changes which cannot be a good thing. A unilateral contractual change moves value to the person who can change the contract. Thirdly, they, le they leverage asymmetrical information and eternal optimism in the policyholder, potentially to their detriment, but most importantly, that leads to outcomes not aligned with expectations, which leads me to my fourth point, potentially compromising optimal consumer outcomes like policyholder reasonable expectations, where I don't end up as the poster boy on the slide um, because I was a little bit optimistic about my trail running capabilities. If we believe, and we do believe, that on aggregate rewards and loyalty schemes have value to add, if we believe that they can continue the trend of South African innovation in insurance, and if we believe that on aggregate they can reduce the risk, reduce the disease burden, and there is value to be transferred. We believe that the insurance and that any sane insurer would transfer that value back to the policyholder on pure commercial basis. But what we would stress is that we consider a market conduct framework that protects the policyholder in managing that mechanism. And what we would propose is that, insure, is that reward schemes are not left outside of the protection and governance of premium reviews and premium guarantees, for example but that we look at key principles to align them. And I'll make three suggestions for you to consider. The first one, very quickly, is aligning the contractual guarantees and review principles to reward rule changes. 
The second one is where contractual changes are made within that guarantee period, make it a buy-in, an opt-in structure where both parties willingly agree to the new contract. If there's so much value and everyone's going to love it, let me agree to that and contract in at that point to allow for continual innovation but continual opting in and not one-sided power imbalance in the contractual relationship. And lastly, an option, talking to Nathia's point, is where there are benefits to give. Give them objectively as upside only. So for example, only as an improvement on the premium projections that the client is expecting and only giving a better result and providing that value to the client. Those are some examples that can align the thinking and give us far better outcomes to pass that value to the client. And that's what I'd like you to consider when you vote. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. Nathia. So, um, thank you um, for that closing, quite powerful. Um, and, I, and I also take uh, where Clyde is coming from, the company that he works uh, for, very uh, flexible design. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, let's, let's tackle the issue of market conduct. So, um, we know that in South Africa there is a, a, um, a multitude of legislations and regulations and um, guidelines um, that we have to deal with it on a daily basis and life is difficult as it is. Um, I would hate to see more legislation and uh, regulations around um, incentive schemes. I do not um, believe that incentive schemes have abused um, policyholders or the public out there. I think they are very clear in terms of what they are trying to achieve. Um, the, the, uh, the aspect of a poor uh, product design or policy design cannot be legislated away. Um, we do need to um, uphold the fact that we are professionals and we need to um, continuously throughout um, what we're doing, whether it is an incentive scheme that is linked to an insurance risk or whether it is considering um, treating customers fairly, we need to, as a profession, uphold those principles and consider those um, in our daily lives. We do, um, however, realize that um, money makes the world go round. Jeremy had a very powerful presentation this morning. Um, everybody is optimistic because um, we can bet on the markets again. That's one of the points I took out of his presentation. And um, we do know that shareholders sometimes decide to actually, similarly to policyholders, where they decide to leave the shareholder, um, they decide to close down incentive schemes. And we've had very um, realistic um, uh, and recent examples of incentive schemes that were closed down in the industry. Um, so shareholders can um, also pull the plug because they might realize pol policyholders are um, really um, generating extra value for themselves. And, and we don't need to um, impose more uh, legislation around that or regulations around that um, because if we create extra value for the policyholders and if they do benefit over time, um, that will benefit society as a whole. Um, we do f uh, feel also... Is that right? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Cool, thanks for those um, really good closing arguments. Um, before we go on to voting, I'd like to just draw your attention to the screen once again. Um, just to read that before you cast your vote. Um, so just to make sure, we're looking at pure risk life insurance product and that bit in brackets not being subject to the same governance requirements should be considered as well. Um, so then, let's move on to the voting. Um, you can take out your phone. And there's two ways that you can vote. You can either go to the website, menti.com, and enter the code top right-hand side, or you can scan the QR code. Um, both will take you to the same place. You have only one vote. Um, you won't be able to re-vote. Um, the website recognizes your IP address or something. So use your vote carefully. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. It looks like that is all the time we have for the debate. Please give the debaters a round of applause. Let's just give it a minute for the results to come in. I'm sure some people have voted. While we wait for the results, to our virtual audience, please kindly mm. note we apologize for technical difficulties in Stream 2 during the 10.15 session. This was caused by an internet problem in the session room and we could not live stream the session out. The session was recorded and will be available within 24 hours and will be posted onto the app. You still will be able to claim CPD for watching the recording. And again, we're very sorry, and we believe that this has been fixed now. Okay, so the, the votes are in. I think um, there we have about 465 votes. Um, it doesn't display on the screen, so I'll need to, need to tell you. Um, so in first place, it's quite a big margin, actually is the blue corner, Andrew and Clyde. So with, so with three, 395 votes against 119 for the red team. Um, so just a quick note is congratulations, Andrew and Clyde, for being the quickest thinking, fastest stalking actuaries. And then I think um, the merit in this debate is actually really to see both sides of the argument, to see both sides presented and see us untangle these ambiguous issues. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of the speakers, debaters and moderators well in these, this um, concurrent session. Sure. <laughs> Please don't forget to go onto the app and also vote for the debate in terms of the debate as a whole so we can decide on which the deba best debate there was within the convention. Also on the app you can find speaker profiles, papers and presentations and you can watch the pre-recorded sessions by Outsurance. Next up is our lunch break, the much anticipated lunch session by our platinum sponsor, SA3, all about remuneration landscape in the actuarial industry. It's taking place right here in Ballroom 1. Please pick up a lunch pack outside in the foyer before coming into the session if you are attending. After lunch, we have concurrent sessions starting at 1.15 p.m. And don't forget, if you need a notepad, or a pen, you can pick one up at the back of the plenary venue, courtesy of Algorithm. We'll see you back in the room at 1.15 p.m. Thank you.